Uh, my name is Lenora Henson, and I'm the curator and director of public programming here at the Theodore Roosevelt inaugural site. Um, actually, is Lindsay around? Lindsay, music. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Um, anyway, oh, wait, no, it's good. <laughs> technical difficulties. Are you good, Lindsay? <laughs> I'm going to continue with our introduction as uh, he works those out. Um, on behalf of our board of trustees and staff, I'd like to welcome everyone to speaker night. I'd especially like to welcome Dr. Joseph McCartan, who is our guest speaker this evening as well as our partners from Cornell and Buffalo, the Partnership for the Public Good, and the Western New York Area Labor Federation, AFL-CIO, who are co-sponsoring this evening's lecture. Speaker Night is our opportunity on the fourth Tuesday of most months to invite experts to come and help us think about some of the issues that were important during TR's presidency <coughs> and continue to be relevant today. The TR site's speaker series is made possible by the generous support of m and Bank, as well as, as well as the New York State Council on the Arts, or NISCA. Our sincere thanks to both of those groups. I should also mention that NISCA's support has enabled us to record all of our speakers, not only this year, but also last year. So if you've missed any of them, I hope you'll check out the recordings on our YouTube channel. As I've already, already mentioned, we are joined this evening by Dr. Joseph McCartan, who is a professor of history and executive director of the Cal Kalmanovitz. Kalmanovitz, thank you. Initiative for Labor and the Working Poor at Georgetown University. He's an expert on U.S. labor, social, and political history. He teaches courses in 20th century U.S. labor history, the U.S. since 1945, America between the wars, modern U.S. state and society, as well as 20th century U.S. social history. <coughs> Dr. McCartan earned both his Ph.D. and M.A. from Binghamton University and also has a BA from the College of Holy Cross. His research and writing focuses on the intersection of labor organization, politics, and public policy. His book, Collision Course, Ronald Reagan, the Air Traffic Controllers, and the Strike That Changed America, won the Richard A. Lester Award for the Outstanding Book in Industrial Relations and Labor Economics, public, published in 2011. Labor's Great War, the Struggle for Industrial Democracy and the Origins of Modern American Labor Relations won the 1999 Philip Tapp Prize for the best book in American labor history. More recently, he co-authored with Melvin Dubofsky the ninth edition of Labor in America, a History. And on a personal note, Joe was also my undergraduate advisor back in the day at SUNY Geneseo. So I am especially uh, honored to introduce Joseph McCartan um, for tonight's talk. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lenora. What a, what a pleasure it is to be here. Um, and when Lenora uh, invited me to come and give this talk, uh, I jumped at the chance. I haven't seen her in many years, but I remembered her as one of the best and most creative students I had as a teacher at SUNY Geneseo years ago. And it's nice that some colleagues are here um, from that experience as well. Um, Lenora wrote this tremendous thesis um, on the Ku Klux Klan in the 1920s and their operation both on Long Island and in Livingston County. Uh, you know, we're not used to thinking of the Klan as something that was a northern phenomenon, but certainly in the 20s it was. And it's a thesis I remember well. I knew then she would go far, and she certainly has, um, and career-wise, but not so far geographically. <laughs> this is a perfect place for her. and. As I've seen what she's done with this place as curator, I'm just blown away. And I hope everybody has had a chance to take in the museum part of this, this beautiful home because it's spectacular. Um, so uh, as she said, I want to talk to you tonight about one aspect of the legacy of the person who was inaugurated president in this building, just steps from where we are in September of 1901, Teddy Roosevelt. Um, I'd like to begin that uh, in a way that I, I see Lenora did the same thing uh, in the way she's introduced the exhibit downstairs by trying to set the context uh, in which Roosevelt came to power. And there's a lovely exhibition of that just downstairs. I want to talk about the man in his context, what was going on, what was America at the moment when he suddenly was thrust into the presidency. Uh, it was a country um, 
that first of all was in the midst of a massive economic reorganization brought on by new technologies like the Bessemer process and steel that had created this enormous steel industry in the country. Mass manufacturing was just beginning uh, in the country. It was eliminating lots of old jobs and creating new jobs as it transformed the economy. It was also a nation that was witnessing uh, the rise of unprecedentedly large and influential corporations like the Standard Oil Company that had not only economic but deep political impact in the country. It was a nation that was producing a new class of rich, unlike any rich uh, in the previous period of American history, rich and powerful and influential people like J.P. Morgan, who we'll talk a little bit more about today. It was a nation which was struggling with the problem of government corruption, government corruption at all levels. Um, uh, from the local cities, uh, Lincoln Steffens was in the process of researching and publishing The Shame of the Cities, detailing some of that corruption, but corruption to the state legislatures, corruption even in the federal government, as this economic transformation began to, in some ways, distort our politics. It was a nation that, in part because of all of this, had just seen an insurgency reshape the Democratic Party, the rise of a, a figure from the fringes of the party, a young man uh, from the Midwest, from Nebraska, William Jennings Bryan, had just won the Democratic nomination in 1896 with his Cross of Gold speech, criticizing some of what was happening with the economic concentration of that time. He won the nomination again in 1900 and was beaten by William McKinley when Teddy Roosevelt was on the ticket as a vice president. The Democratic Party was being pushed in a new direction by the uh, forces that, that uh, William Jennings Bryan represented. It was a country that was producing lots of new wealth, um, uh, vast increases in productivity uh, made possible by some of these new technologies, yes, but it was leaving behind a lot of people. Uh, and in much of urban and industrial America, poverty reigned and insecurity marked the lives of working people. It was a nation where the Supreme Court was acting as an obstacle to virtually any activity to try to move uh, forward for especially the most oppressed Americans uh, of that time. The Supreme Court uh, that was in office when Teddy Roosevelt became president was mostly governed by people who had made decisions like Plessy versus Ferguson in 1896, opening the door to segregation, like Williams Missis versus Mississippi in 1898, which okayed the disfranchisement of many African Americans where they had been able to vote. It was the same Supreme Court that had decided that the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890 could be applied against unions. Um, and they could be treated as trusts, uh, as happened with the American Railway Union in a case called In Re Debs. They decided that that union, by engaging in a strike, the Pullman boycott, was in fact uh, violating interstate trade. Debs ended up in jail over that, uh, the leader of the strike, Eugene Debs. It was a nation where um, workers were having a very difficult time trying to organize in part because the law did not protect that right. Uh, it was a nation uh, where the labor movement organized less than 10% of the country. It was a nation whose workforce was being rapidly changed by the arrival of about a million new immigrants a year at the time when Roosevelt took office coming through places like Ellis Island from Eastern and Southern Europe. It was a place where, as a result of the rise of those immigrant workers, you can't really make this out very well, but uh, this is a political cartoon from the time calling for immigration restriction. It says, close the gate. Um, and it was a time and place in our country's history where fear of immigrants was causing the rise of an anti-immigrant feeling uh, that, uh, in fact, um, was, was expressed in organizations like the uh, Immigration Restriction League, 
which had been founded in the 1890s and was quite active when Roosevelt took his oath of office. And it was a nation where, in part, this new immigration was being linked in the public mind to acts of terrorism. In fact, what had brought uh, Theodore Roosevelt to this house to take the oath of office in September 1901 was the fact that William McKinley was assassinated by an immigrant uh, named Leon Zogos uh, in, at the um, exposition in Buffalo. Here you see uh, the assassin depicted with a handkerchief that covered the gun in his hand uh, that shot McKinley in the abdomen and led to his death. It was a country, in other words, in which a lot was going on that was causing upheaval, unrest, and uncertainty. And it was into this country that Teddy Roosevelt came uh, and uh, stepped into the presidency. When he took the oath of office, just you know, steps from where we currently stand. Uh, as I said, to become the 26th President of the United States on September 14, 1901. So about 117 years ago. That was the America of 117 years ago that Teddy <coughs> Roosevelt suddenly became President in. Uh, his arrival in the presidency was unexpected. Uh, and uh, I'll come to that in a second. The America that I've just been describing that existed in 1901 uh, should in some ways sound quite familiar to us, I think. Because just as that America was being reshaped by the rise of things like the steel industry at that time, we are living through an economy that's being reshaped by other profound forces. This is a picture of a, an Amazon warehouse where robots pull the uh, things off of shelves and assemble the goods that you often order from a company like that. Our economy is being reshaped not only by the Amazons, but by the rise of the equivalent of the standard oils of our time. Companies like Walmart that have such profound impact on just about every sector of the retail economy that we uh, live in. Um, it's a world that has its own J.P. Morgans, um, people like Jeff Bezos. Uh, who is now the richest man in the world, the founder of Amazon, uh, by most accounting. Um, it's a world that has its own problems with corruption as well. As we've seen in our time, lots of uh, evidence of government corruption. In fact, I would say that since the Citizens United decision uh, of now eight years ago, the flood of money into our political process, and especially dark money, unaccountable money, uh, is distorting our politics more than probably at any time since the time of Roosevelt and the concerns that people like Lincoln Steffens were raising in that time. And just as in Roosevelt's time, uh, left-wing insurgency began to push the Democratic Party in one direction, uh, so too has that happened in our own time, our, our own William Jennings Bryan, you might say, has been Bernie Sanders. Uh, and the forces that he uh, gave life to, which has pushed the Democratic Party leftward more recently, just in a sense as uh, Jennings Bryan did in his time. While the America of 117 years ago was not sharing its bounty broadly, um, I think the same could be said of today. The stock market, you know, I haven't checked what happened today, but last I looked, it was basically at an all-time high. Um, if you are a person who makes most of your income from investment, this is the best time to live that we've ever had, probably in this country. However, if you make most of your income from wages, especially hourly wages, uh, it's a different kind of world. and much of America is not experiencing, even in this moment of high unemployment, or, or low unemployment, and high employment, uh, much uh, prosperity. In fact, wages continue 
to stagnate for many. And the lion's share of income gains, especially since the Great Recession, have gone even to the top 1% uh, in our country. Kind of familiar, in a sense, to the way it was in Roosevelt's time. And just as the Supreme Court in Roosevelt's time was a court that uh, was blocking uh, uh, advancement and civil rights and workers' rights especially, I think you could say the same of the Supreme Court that uh, currently uh, holds its seats. Uh, I don't know if you've been following its decisions in the past few years, but it basically has gutted the Voting Rights Act. Uh, and it more recently, uh, in a case called Janus versus AFSCME, delivered a, a very hard blow to the American Union Movement by basically denying public sector unions the opportunity to collect money from the workers that they're compelled to represent. If there's a contract in a workplace, the union has to represent the workers covered by that contract, whether the workers pay at all or not. Uh, some states, like New York, had developed a system which, which unions called um, a fair share payment, in which if the union has to represent you, you have to pay a fee for that representation so that everybody shares the cost. Now those fees are deemed to be an unconstitutional infringement on workers' rights to not pay union <coughs> fees. The union is still obligated to represent, but you don't have to pay for that anymore. That was the recent Supreme Court. In Roosevelt's time, it was hard to form unions, um, and I, the labor movement was struggling. Less than 10% of workers were in unions at that time, and the same could be said of recent times. This is a picture of Wisconsin in 2011 when the governor there, Scott Walker, ran through a bill that basically made it impossible for public employees to bargain collectively anymore in Wisconsin. The union movement in this country has been significantly weakened, and I would argue it's weaker now than it's been at any time since uh, the early 20th century. Immigration was transforming the world of Roosevelt 117 years ago, uh, and it's also been transforming our world. Uh, there have been more immigrants arriving in the U.S. in recent years than, again, at any time since the early 20th century. That's slowed down some since the Great Recession, although, uh, you know, overall, we have a higher percentage of immigrant stock, that is, people who are either immigrants themselves or the children of immigrants than we've had at any time since before World War I. In Roosevelt's time, it was closed the gate uh, that many were saying. In our time, you might say it's build the wall. Um, quite a similarity in some ways, you might say. In Roosevelt's time, it was about uh, a fear of immigrant anarchists uh, and what they might do, people like McKinley's assassin. In our time, uh, much of that fear of immigrants has been focused on uh, radical Islam uh, and uh, the events of 9-11 have had a lot to do with that. The world we currently inhabit then, in many ways, just starkly resembles the world that Teddy Roosevelt stepped into uh, on September 14, 1901 to take leadership of. Interestingly enough, um, as Roosevelt stepped into his world facing problems quite similar to these, another person who was a very unlikely president in some ways stepped into the world that we currently inhabit, Donald Trump. Um, in some ways, uh, I'd say is a, a similar kind of figure uh, to Teddy Roosevelt, at least in the surface sense, uh, in this way. Both New Yorkers, neither of them seen by party leaders of the party that nominated them to be real party regulars. Trump, for most of his life, wasn't a uh, Republican at all, right? Um, when Teddy Roosevelt was recruited for the uh, Republican vice presidential ticket in, uh, in 1900, he was recruited in part because, as governor of New York, he was so angering uh, regular 
Republican leaders in the state, they wanted to get rid of him. They thought, let's make him vice president. Uh, you might know that, um, uh, I think it was Daniel Webster in 1848, he was approached about being vice president, and he turned it down saying, uh, I propose not to be buried until I die. <laughs> and that was the way many people felt about the vice presidency. Um, to get Teddy Roosevelt into that um, position then was seen by the regulars of the party as getting him out of our hair. It was never really dreamed that he would suddenly become president. One of the people who opposed putting him on the ticket at that time was um, Mark Hanna, the senator from Ohio. I'll talk about him a little bit more in a minute. He was one of the most important leaders of the party at the time. He was not certain about Roosevelt. Um, uh, and uh, in fact, um, was, was not all that happy with the selection of, of Roosevelt um, as the vice president. Uh, but nonetheless, um, uh, uh, he was selected. I, I wanted to read a, a quote. Uh, when he was nominated, this is what Hannah said, don't any of you realize there's only one life between this madman and the presidency? Uh, and then when he heard that McKinley had died, he said to companions reportedly, now look, that damn cowboy is president of the United States. Um, as we'll, we'll see, Hannah and Roosevelt actually developed a pretty good working relationship. That's alluded to in some of the exhibits here. But at the time, Roosevelt was not necessarily trusted by his political party leaders, and I think you could have said the same about Republican leaders about Trump. They did not uh, necessarily want or trust him. A lot of surface similarities you might be able to point to. A lot of deep differences, though, at the same time. I'll just touch on a few. I don't want to get political, but just to to make a point about the difference between that time and ours. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt spent his life mostly in public service. He was born in wealth like Trump, grew up in New York City like Trump. Wasn't about increasing that wealth, however, but instead, from the time he worked as police commissioner of New York, uh, uh, later becoming secretary of the Navy, well, governor, vice president, <coughs> devoted himself to public service. Uh, whereas uh, our, the current president was a businessman really his whole life. Uh, where Teddy Roosevelt jumped into the military at first opportunity in the Spanish-American War, uh, that was not Donald Trump's uh, approach in the Vietnam War. Where um, Roosevelt sent his sons into the military, neither did Donald Trump do that. Roosevelt lost a son in World War I in service. We could go on and, and point out lots of differences between these men, but I point this out not to be political or even cast aspersions on Trump, but just to say this, to make the point that sometimes people say that history repeats itself. Um, and whenever I hear students say that, I quickly want to say no, that, that's really not true. Um, history never quite repeats itself. Um, Karl Marx once put a little twist on that, and he said, History repeats itself the first time as tragedy, the second time as farce. Marx could be very clever, um, but I don't think that's true either. Uh, instead, though, I like a saying that's been attributed to Mark Twain about history. And what Twain reputedly has said about it, about it is, history doesn't repeat itself, but occasionally it rhymes. And I think that that's kind of the way we might think about that time and our time. They're different, but they kind of rhyme. And what I'd like to suggest to you today is that when we look more deeply into Roosevelt's time and Roosevelt himself, that in the rhyme, you might say, between that time and ours, are some important lessons between that we can discover uh, about our time uh, in dealing with the problems that we have to face today. So having said that, I'm going to focus on two things about Roosevelt and his time. Two things that he did in his first year in office, within months of being in this building and 
taking the oath of office on September 14, 1901. Events that unfolded between them and uh, October 13th of the following year. So a very short period of time, about 13 months. He did two incredibly important things that I think helped shape an important legacy for his presidency and point the country in a direction that would be foundational for the 20, 20th century. The first was he dealt with the problem of the trusts in a way that no predecessor had done. He had to figure out what to do when he learned that the largest yet monopoly of railroads was being put together, a monopoly that was called the Northern Securities Company. It was basically a monopoly that was built of putting together the nation's two biggest networks of railroads between the Midwest and the West. The first was called the Great Northern Railroad. The second was called the Northern Pacific. And you can see the lines uh, that the Great Northern had, that the Northern Pacific had. And what was intended was to bring these two big lines together in one giant holding company that would basically, if you look at this map, control pretty much all traffic between Chicago and the Midwest, even down to St. Louis, and everything north of Northern California. It would control a massive amount of uh, American transportation, a big chunk of the American economy of that time. Um, the question was, should this happen or not? If Teddy Roosevelt had not taken the oath of office here in this building, uh, in 1901, I'm pretty sure that would have happened. It didn't happen though, because he was the president. Before his presidency, there had been concern about monopoly. There had been concern about monopoly that had arisen in the years after the Civil War. The populist movement had tried to regulate the railroads in the 1870s, the beginning of the the Grange movement, the farmer movement, enacted what were called Granger laws. The populist movement arose in the 1880s and 90s to try to push for more. In 1890, they got the Sherman Antitrust Act passed. It was a big tool that you could use, supposedly, to regulate trusts. But that's not how it was used. In fact, um, when the uh, Act was passed, it was not used against any significant monopoly until Roosevelt tried to use it that way. It had been used, as I said, against a railroad union in 1894 to break that union and break that strike. In 1895, the Supreme Court said, yeah, use it that way. In 1895, the Supreme Court heard another case about how, how to use or not use that act. It was called the E.C. Knight case. In that case, the court considered whether the act was meant to regulate monopolies that were not transportation monopolies, like railroads, but manufacturing monopolies. The case in question was a sugar refining monopoly run by this E.C. Knight concern. And what the Supreme Court remarkably concluded was that, well, this act is about interstate trade. It uses the term trade. It doesn't say manufacturing. So actually, it can't be used to regulate that kind of trust. And so it wasn't. Um, and so the act had not been used in a significant way to curb monopolistic corporate power until Teddy Roosevelt uh, instructed his uh, attorney general uh, to, his name was Philander Knox, to go ahead and file suit under the Sherman Act and block the construction of this gigantic monopoly. It was too much power, too capable of being abused, and he wouldn't allow it to, to form. By the way, this was a, uh, a concern that was being put together by three of the richest men of their time, E.H. Harriman, J.J. Hill on the far right, and again, then the ever-present J.P. Morgan in the middle. It was Morgan's bank that helped to finance the bringing together of these gigantic lines. Uh, they were powerful people. They had strong political connections. They had strong connections to Roosevelt's party. 
but he decided to stand up and block this because he felt it was just too much power and too capable of abusing the public. He pursued the case uh, and ultimately the Supreme Court sided with the president and said he had the right to pursue the case uh, and in fact it upheld uh, the, the blocking of that merger. By then the court, by the way, included a figure on the upper left in the back named Oliver Wendell Holmes. One of the first things Roosevelt did, one of the things he did in his first year in office is he appointed Holmes to the court. Holmes was a person who really helped to modernize American law into the 20th century. He would have looked at as crazy the notion which some people strongly hold to today that the way to interpret a legal question is what would the Founding Fathers have thought about them? The Founding Fathers did not live with railroads. They had nothing like that. They did not live with the E.C. Knights. They did not have any of the problems that industrial America was living with. The law is a living thing, is what Holmes argued, and we need to treat it that way. The Constitution is not meant to be the dead hand of history resting upon us. It's empowered us to preserve a democracy, a constitutional democracy. Roosevelt's stance in the, the Northern Securities case then was a, a very important uh, breakthrough because it was the first time that anybody took on a trust in this way. This is how a cartoonist portrayed it later. The very simple message of the big stick, he who runs may read. Uh, obey the law is what the stick says and the railroads in the back saying, Mr. P President, please go easy. Um, by the way, the big stick, you're used to thinking about that term, I bet, uh, as a thing that refers to how Roosevelt viewed U.S. foreign policy, and sure enough, that is true. He did use it in that way, but that's not the only way he used it. Uh, he used that phrase as early as 1900 in a private letter he wrote. Uh, to a friend in which he was referring to something and he, he said uh, uh, speak softly and carry a big stick and you will go far he wrote this letter and he said that's a West African proverb and that's what it was did anybody here know that? you probably thought he made it up it came from West Africa that tells you something about Teddy Roosevelt he traveled, he read, he was a historian he wrote many books, he was an intellectual uh, as much as a politician, and could have been one of the leading intellectuals of his time, uh, and knew even some West African proverbs, apparently. The big stick here meant government standing up for the common good against private interests that might abuse the common good. It was an important uh, principle at stake, and one that Roosevelt uh, established with this. Now I should say this before we go on to the second point, and that is that Roosevelt gets this nickname as the trust buster. Um, often that's quite exaggerated. He didn't bust that many trusts, in point of fact. Um, and in some ways he was fairly conservative about the use of that power. But nonetheless, that shouldn't obscure the importance of what he did here, because he put down a marker. And that would be a marker that subsequent generations and political figures could build on. And the marker was simply this. Do private interests, are they accountable to the public good? They ought to be. And that's the, the um, point he made in this particular case. So that's case one, the Northern Securities case. The second case I want to speak a few minutes to you about concerns what Roosevelt did in his time to stand up for working people uh, and to stand up for what he called a fair deal, or square deal, excuse me. This is a, a I think you call it a stereograph, I saw a machine out there that used to put these in, is that the right term? Used to look through a thing and you'd look at two images and it would look 3D to you. It was quite the thing before the internet, I guess. <laughs> um, this is a stereograph of Roosevelt giving a speech in Lynn, Massachusetts on August 25th, 1902. In that speech, uh, he said this, 
So in our country as a whole, we must have wise legislation. We must have honest, fearless, and able administrators of the law. All law must be so administered as to secure justice for all alike. A square deal for every man, great or small, rich or poor. I think he must have liked how that term square deal rung, because he held on to it. He started to use it, he ultimately wrote a book uh, called that. And that idea became central to him. And it was one that was only slightly amended by his cousin uh, later, Franklin Roosevelt, with what he called the New Deal. And as we'll see before I'm done, there were many ways in which the cousin would Im imitate his predecessor. What Roosevelt was thinking about when he gave that speech in uh, Lynn, Massachusetts in, in August of 1902 was what was going on in the nation's coal mines. Coal had been absolutely crucial to the American Industrial Revolution. Without the labor of men like this, most of whom were immigrant, um, many of whom were African American, though not in this picture, uh, in much of the South and even into West Virginia that was true. Without their labor there would have been no steel mills, no railroads, no industrial revolution. This work was tremendously dangerous. It was seasonal. It was unstable. Uh, it was very dangerous to your health, not only from the potential of mine cave-ins, but from the black lung that many miners got. And it was also work that meant working for some of the most authoritarian employers in the United States. Coal mine operators were notoriously authoritarian. They often required that workers live in company homes and that they accept as payment scrip, not dollars, but IOUs that could only be spent in the company store. And by no means did they tolerate or were they prepared to accept unions among those workers, and they fought them bitterly whenever they emerged. Nonetheless, by the 1890s, a union movement did emerge in the nation's coal mines. A, a new organization called the United Mine Workers was founded in 1890. It was led by 1898 by a very young man. He was just 28 when he took the leadership of it, named John Mitchell. Uh, and Mitchell had helped to lead a strike in 1897 that had won union recognition in the soft coal region of the country, which was mainly Ohio, some of uh, West Virginia and Western Pennsylvania. The United Mine Workers won, in effect, an eight-hour workday as well as a result of that strike in those bituminous mines, otherwise known as soft coal mines. Um, and Mitchell was emerging as a hero uh, in the labor movement of his time. That was a huge breakthrough for unionized workers. But it didn't extend to all coal miners. The nation's anthracite miners, that is hard coal miners, most of whom were concentrated in central and eastern Pennsylvania, they mined a form of coal that burned more cleanly and was used to heat homes uh, in the early 20th century, anthracite coal. The problem with the anthracite coal mines and miners, though, is that most of the mines were owned by railroads. And many of the railroads were owned in whole or in part by J.P. Morgan and his extensive uh, list of holdings. Those who held those mines were opposed to the idea of union recognition, uh, and they fought it. Um, in, uh, 1900, in September of 1900, September 17th to be exact, the anthracite miners, knowing, by the way, what soft coal miners had been able to win in Ohio, just were losing patience and they wanted to go on strike. Um, Mitchell didn't think that they were ready to win a strike, but he couldn't hold them back, and so on September 17th, 1900, uh, they went out on strike and a massive strike that happened then less than two months before a presidential election. Um, it created a controversy. William Jennings Bryan was then running against William McKinley with the outcome or the, the course of this strike affect the election. 
People weren't sure. One group of people who was very nervous about it were Republican leaders, especially that guy I mentioned earlier, Senator Mark Hanna, Marcus Hanna. Um, and Hanna here was like, we have to get this strike settled because we can't take chances that it's going to result in McKinley being defeated. Um, and so he put pressure on his friend, J.P. Morgan, to put pressure on the mines that Morgan had large interests in to say, you've got to give the workers a wage increase. You don't have to recognize the union, but we'll bet that if you give them a significant wage increase, they will call off the strike. Uh, and that's exactly what happened. They called off the strike in return for a wage increase um, a week before the election uh, in November, in part because of the intercession of Hannah. He didn't want this hanging out there. Mitchell knew that the union wasn't strong enough to fight for more than a wage increase then, something like union recognition, so he took half a loaf and he figured we'll come back for the rest later. That later came in 1902. Um, in 1902, uh, by the spring of that year, miners were ready to demand that their union be accepted by the mine operators and that the operators negotiate with them. They were determined to strike. They called a strike vote and they walked out on May 12th of 1902, initiating a long struggle with the mine operators. I said J.P. Morgan's interests were dominant in these mines and that's true, but Morgan's man in the mines uh, of the time uh, was the then a chief executive of the Reading Railroad, uh, whose name uh, uh, was George F. Bear. And Bear was the person who spoke for the mine operators at a time when this strike was going on. Bear was absolutely adamant from day one, we will never recognize a union. We'll deal with miners individually. We will never bargain collectively with them. Uh, it's our freedom as American employers to employ who we want. And any worker should work here, whether they want to work here or not. We will not deal with unions. Um, and so the strike lasted into the summer. Uh, and this is a cartoon speaking of how it was being received. The stance of the coal operators, no concessions, no arbitration. They didn't even want a mediator. There's nothing to mediate. These mines are here. If miners want to work, they're open for business. But we're not going to negotiate with any union. Um, there'll be no concessions on this point, no arbitration. Um, and as you see in this cartoon, that's a threat that's blocking the, the beautifully costumed Lady Prosperity. You can see what her companion there. It might wreck the economy, people felt. In the summer, it was okay to sort of run low on hard coal because it was mostly heating coal. You didn't really need it. Moreover, the, there had been big supplies that had been built up in the spring. There were big stockpiles there. That's partly why the miners said, we're not working anymore after May 12th because they didn't want to contribute to continuing to stockpile coal for employers who were never going to negotiate with them to stop it. Um, the strike uh, lasted into the uh, summer. And by mid-June, Roosevelt was starting to think, maybe we have to get involved in this. Now, note this. The federal government had gotten involved in strikes before, but always by sending in the army, always by breaking the strike. They did that when canal workers struck during Andrew Jackson's time when they were digging the CNO Canal. They did that uh, in 1877 when the Great Railroad Strike happened. They did that in 1894 during the aforementioned Pullman boycott. If the government got involved before this, it meant they broke the strike. They brought in the army and they crushed the union. That had historically been the approach. Roosevelt did something different. He didn't send in the army. He sent in his commissioner of labor. His name was Carol D. Wright. This is his picture. He said, investigate this for me, Wright. Tell me what's going on. 
Wright came back with uh, uh, the results of his investigation. And he basically said, like, the problem here is the owners. They just won't negotiate. They're sitting on high profits. They uh, won't give in to the union, almost just in spite of the union. Uh, and at the end of his report he gave to Roosevelt, he gave several suggestions. He's, he called these suggestions that seemed just and reasonable. <coughs> he proposed that, that the work day be reduced from the 10 hours that miners have been working to at least nine. Maybe we can't give them the eight that other miners have won, but at least has it come down to nine, he said. That we have to have a joint committee formed that can conciliate this. Uh, thing, and that there has to be some kind of collective bargain between the miners and uh, the operators. Roosevelt read the report and he liked it. He didn't want to release it right away though because he had some qualms. Do I really want to put myself and my administration in the midst of this strike? He kind of hoped it would end, uh, but instead it dragged on. It dragged on into August. It was on his mind when he went to Lynn and talked about the square deal because he knew that's not what was happening in the coal mines of the country where that strike was going on. And public opinion started to get increasingly restive. Here is George Bear, the mine uh, uh, spokesperson, being shown to reach into a cookie jar in which he's trying to pull out the cookie of unconditional surrender. That's what he wants from the miners and ignoring the smaller cookie that says arbitration, which would be small enough to remove from the cookie jar. Uh, the public, you can see, is getting increasingly unhappy with his approach. That's also true of Roosevelt himself. By the beginning of September, he was coming to the position that something's got to be done. Uh, I'm going to have to get involved in this. And he was actually angry by the expressed opinion of Bear at the time when the when the press asked him like you know why won't you negotiate this is what he said the rights and interests of the laboring man will be protected and cared for not by labor agitators but by the Christian men to whom God in his infinite wisdom has given the control of the property interests of this country <laughs> that was his view God put me here, and I know what's best, <laughs> as do my colleagues, Messrs. J.P. Morgan, etc. That was in public position. Roosevelt was not happy with that, let's just say it that. Um, he summoned both sides to the White House. Uh, it was then a provisional White House in Lafayette Square because they were building what's now the West Wing of the White House. One of the things we did is actually modernize the building, too. October 30 convened a conference in the White House trying to see if he could get both sides to, to talk with each other, and he was completely disgusted by what happened. Mitchell arrived at the conference, the head of the miners, just walking on air, first of all. A president has invited a leader of a union to the White House to sit to negotiate, to negotiate the end of the strike. This is real progress. This is a great thing. Uh, the mine operators, uh, on the other hand, they arrived at a very different uh, frame of mind. This is how Roosevelt uh, described it himself. Mitchell, he said, behaved, quote, with great dignity and moderation. The operators, he said, quote, showed extraordinary stupidity and temper. <laughs> they refused to sit in the same room as Mitchell. They would not give the union the ability to say that it was sitting on an equal plane uh, with, uh, with workers or with, with managers. Um, this was the position as the country was now in early October. Nights were starting to get colder. People were starting to want to heat their homes. The stockpiles were starting to diminish. What Roosevelt said to his frenemy, you might say, Mark Hanna, was this. A coal famine in the winter is an ugly thing, and I fear we shall see terrible 
suffering and grave disaster. And Hannah agreed. You know, he he had close friendships with, with Morgan and others, but he understood this is a problem. We have to figure out a way out of it. A stalemate was, was deepening, though, after the October 3rd meeting. And Roosevelt became increasingly worried about it. And uh, he reached out to Elihu Root is Secretary of War, Secretary of State, um, a very trusted advisor who happened to be an excellent corporate lawyer before he was uh, in the administration, had worked on Wall Street, knew J.P. Morgan very well. And Roosevelt dispatched Ruth basically to see if he could work out some kind of compromise with Morgan. On October 11th of 1902, uh, Ruth went north to New York City uh, and climbed aboard J.P. Morgan's yacht, the Corsair. They reputedly sat on the yacht to shield themselves from the press. And in a five-hour meeting, they worked out details of a compromise, a face-saving proposal that Ruth then brought back to Roosevelt on October 13th. The idea they proposed was to create an arbitration commission that would include a military engineer, a mining engineer, a judge, an expert in the coal business, and uh, a person they called an eminent sociologist who could look at the facts of the case and come up with a solution. And the idea was we'll approach both sides and say, let's call this off and let the commission arbitrate a solution to this. Uh, Morgan put enough pressure on Bear and the interests over which he had influence to get them to finally go along with it. Mitchell was a little bit more concerned. Can I really trust these people? So he pushed Roosevelt to amend the proposal. He didn't want a five-person commission. He wanted a seven-person commission. And what do you mean by eminent sociologist, he said. Uh, I need a labor person. I need somebody who understands unions on this commission. And Roosevelt agreed. He seemed that that was fair. He said, okay, we'll name the head of the conductor's union as the eminent sociologist. Roosevelt turned to somebody, uh, one of his advisors, and said, I bet the fellow never heard the term eminent sociologist before, but that's what we'll make him. And for the purposes of this, they did. Mitchell also demanded that a Catholic bishop be put on the commission. Most minors were Catholic. He felt like they wouldn't trust the com uh, commission, or they would trust it better if they felt uh, a person of their faith, a faith leader, was on the commission. And so, ultimately, this was the conclusion. After 103 days out on strike, then, the great anthracite coal strike came to an end. Um, well, that's, that's Roosevelt's attitude after that. October 3rd meeting, we must have that coal. Uh, by the way, this is a, a drawing of J.P. Morgan and Bear coming to talk to Roosevelt to present their compromise proposal on October 13th, 1902. You'll note Roosevelt had his leg up on a stool. He had recently been injured. Uh, a trolley car rammed into the carriage he was riding in, and he was still recovering from that while all this was going on. Roosevelt worked out the deal. Uh, he got Mitchell to go along with it. Uh, the commission was created, the seven-person commission. That's the Catholic bishop, second from the right in the back. Uh, the commission then engaged in a series of hearings. It went out to coal country. It interviewed miners. It looked at some of the problems that they were going uh, through. Uh, and basically then, after three months of study, issued findings that both sides accepted. They basically split the difference. Uh, the miners had asked for a 20% increase in wages. The commission gave them 10. The miners had asked for an eight-hour workday. They had worked 10. The commission gave them nine. Uh, the operators had refused to recognize the union right, and they continued to refuse to do that. But Mitchell believed that if the commission was effectively arbitrating, that was almost like recognizing the union's existence. So he believed, we'll take this. 
It basically opens the door to the establishment of the Union in the nation's coal mines. And so came to an end this very important uh, event. And as it was portrayed at the time, the miner and the operator shaking hands over stacks of evidence assembled by this commission, which laid the basis for their ultimate agreement. This was not calling out the army. This was a whole different approach to what role should the federal government play in labor relations. So what's important about these two events? What legacy did they leave? I'd say they were the founding events of the Roosevelt presidency and of his whole philosophy of government. The square deal idea that basically he was formulating as he settled this, ultimately he adopted that idea. And it became the sort of animating vision uh, of his legacy. But you can see in both of these events, I think, something of the real uh, complicated character of what Teddy Roosevelt was. This is a cartoon from the 1912 Bull Moose campaign. After he left the presidency, as you know, and his term ended in, 20, in 1909, uh, he got disaffected with his uh, successor, Taft. Thought he was far too conservative. Had basically given away the store to the opponents of some of his environmental legislation, for example. And so he decided to form his own party in, in uh, 1912 and to run as a progressive, the Bull Moose Party. And as this cartoon shows about the Bull Moose Party, it had a little bit of everything. Uh, it had a little bit of pure democracy, a little bit of conservative views, a little bit of radical spice, uh, a little bit in the back of something called any old view, and it was <laughs> stirred together in this progressivism mix. And there's something of all of that in what I've just described of Roosevelt in both Northern Securities and the anthracite strike. He was no radical. He was not even a New Dealer. He was not what his cousin would be. But he was an innovator. He took the problems of his time and he applied a new, and in some cases, and some people thought they were radical changes. Like, now the federal government will help to settle strikes and arbitrate them? Doesn't this infringe on the property rights of owners? Some believed it did. He didn't share that view. What he established was a very different kind of approach to government. I think there are two real important legacies of what Roosevelt did in these two events. One is that he decided to make it a principle that the federal government ought to advance the common good and do that even if it meant confronting what he came to call malefactors of great wealth. That was a term he first used in a speech later in 1907 when he went to Provincetown, Massachusetts. If you've ever been there, you, you know that there's a beautiful tower there, a monument to the pilgrims and their arrival. He went to the dedication of that monument. Uh, and while there, he talked about the need to discipline the malefactors of great wealth. The great wealthy who will use their wealth and power to amass more wealth and power, no matter what it does to the common good. What Roosevelt did in the Northern Securities case is he advanced a different idea that the federal government ought to be the defender with sword and shield of the public welfare. That's what the shield says there. I reckon that in our time, if I was to say the word public welfare to you, outside of the context of this conversation, it would probably hold for you the faint odor of a pejorative. Public welfare is not a good thing, is it? Doesn't it mean big government, statism? Doesn't it mean, you know, welfare for those who don't work as hard? Public welfare in Roosevelt's time was something to defend with passion, and he did. And by setting that example even, that symbolic example, in the time of the Northern Securities case, he laid down a marker that would shape things that followed. 
It would certainly deeply shape the administration of his cousin, Teddy Roosevelt, or uh, Franklin Roosevelt. The second important legacy I think that, that Teddy Roosevelt established in 1902 was that he planted the seed for an idea that became central to American social policy and vision in the first three quarters of the 20th century that followed this, an idea called industrial democracy. It was not an idea that Roosevelt used, by the way, in the in his own rhetoric in 1902, as he was pushing for collective bargaining between the miners and the operators. But at the very time that Roosevelt was constructing that accord in the coal fields, um, Sidney and Beatrice Webb, the English socialists, um, Fabian socialists, were writing a book, they had begun it in 1897 with volume one, and it finally reached the U.S. in 1902, the same year, published by Longman in New York that year. It was called Industrial Democracy, uh, and in it, they described a vision for the 20, 20th century, which they argued that the rise of massive industrial concerns necessitated that if we're going to have democracy in the 20th century, it can't just be in polling places and legislatures. It has to be in workplaces. It has to govern the employer-employee relationship. Workers have to have a voice in the workplace. They have to be able to help to shape the terms of under which they work. They have to have a voice. They have to have something of democracy and in industry, industrial democracy. That term started to gain adherence in the U.S. in the years after 1902. By the time Woodrow Wilson appointed a, a commission, the U.S. Commission on Industrial Rela Relations in 1913, it conducted a two-year inquiry into the sorry state of American labor relations in general in the years before World War I, oppression, uh, breaking of unions, violence, no respect for workers' rights to organize, that commission said, what we need is industrial democracy. It began to use that term. When during World War I, Wilson created the National War Labor Board to create policies to provide labor peace during the war, that board officially made it its goal to secure industrial democracy, giving workers the right to have a voice. Those two foundational ideas fighting for the public welfare and the common good, that's government's job, and workers needing to have a voice in their workplace, I would argue that they were the two central pillars on which 20th century America was built. The America that became a much more generous, prosperous, democratic with a small d society. I would argue, though, that those two pillars are in ruins today that both of those ideas, that government has to confront the malefactors of great wealth to conserve the common good, or that workers need to be able to, if we're going to have a democracy, have a voice in their workplaces, that neither of those things stand in good stead today. And so what are the lessons of what Roosevelt accomplished in his time for this very tumultuous world that we now represent. Let me conclude with some thoughts about that. I'd like to do that by first talking about the largest owner of residential real estate in the U.S. today. The largest owner of commercial office space in the U.S. today. The world's largest investor in hedge funds today. An entity that controls 150 corporations today. The largest owner of logistics companies in Europe now. A, an entity that owns a half a trillion dollars in assets now. An entity that has a half a million employees. An entity whose principals pay less in taxes on what they earn than I bet most people in this room pay. 
I'm describing one company here. Does anybody, extra points here. Does anybody know what the name of the company is? You say Walmart? Yes. I won't reveal the name until I'll get any other guesses. I'm gonna guess Amazon. You say Amazon? Who? Coke. Oh, Coke Industries, the Coke brothers. No. None of you are right. No. Did you ever hear of this company, this organization? Now, I will say this to you. I think it's really important. I think it's very revealing that nobody guessed that it's Blackstone, that it's the Blackstone Group, that it's the largest private equity firm in the world that does all of this. A firm founded by Stephen Schwartzman in 1985 that is the largest owner of residential real estate in the U.S. now. Housing prices in places like Northern California, which are skyrocketing, they're investing in the hopes that those prices will go up further, right? Making it difficult for many working families to even live near the jobs that they have anymore. This is a company that's involved, as they say, in their approach in almost everything, right? But it's not a company that springs to your lips. It's not a company you think about. But I would argue that it's the dominant kind of company in our time. It represents a kind of capitalism that we have today that's new. It didn't exist 30 or 40 years ago. What could be called financialized capitalism? The financialized economy. A global financial capitalism. Now think about it. Blackstone. I said half a trillion in um, holdings. When Teddy Roosevelt walked in here and you know took that oath of office, 117 years ago. Earlier that same year, in February of that year actually, another thing was happening. The creation of what was then the largest company ever seen in the world, United States Steel. And it was capitalized at that time at a billion dollars. And that time that was a huge amount of money. Its size, its power, unprecedented. Teddy Roosevelt was stepping into a world that was being reshaped by a new kind of corporation. U.S. Steel. That type of corporation. Corporations of enormous power. You know who put U.S. Steel together? Another extra credit. Possibility. J.P. Morgan, J.P. Morgan bought out and helped buy out Carnegie Steel and the other steel company. Basically, it was Morgan Constructor, right? So what was happening, what was emerging in the economy of 117 years ago was a new kind of corporate entity. What Teddy Roosevelt's administration was about in very large terms was how do you make a democracy work in a world of a billion dollar corporation. And in his view, that meant we've got to use government. We've got to use it in just the ways I've said. We've got to use it to defend the public welfare. We've got to use it to make sure that if they have that power, that there be some countervailing power that workers have. U.S. Steel in that time, Blackstone in our time. I would argue this, that the problems that I've mentioned that we're seeing in our current economy, inequality at levels that have not been seen almost since Roosevelt's time, go directly to the fact we have no answer yet for the kind of world dominated for a black stone. 150 different companies are owned by this entity. Those workers never get to negotiate with Blackstone, even if they are in a union. At most, they get to negotiate with the people below where the real power is in this country. What has happened in the creation of entities like this, I would argue to you, is really threatening to this country in the long run. It's threatening to the idea of social equality. It's threatening to the idea of shared prosperity. 
This was an enormously wealthy company. They've done very well in the past 10 years, while much of America has not. Unless we figure out ways to hold those kinds of companies accountable to the common good in the way that Roosevelt held the likes of U.S. Steel accountable in his time, I think we're going to continue to struggle in the century ahead. I think it's up to us in our time to figure out the answer to these kinds of problems. I think we can learn a lot from Teddy Roosevelt. As I said, history doesn't repeat itself, but occasionally it rhymes. I think it's up to us to find the rhyme for Teddy Roosevelt in our time. So thank you very much.